If I had known that explaining what the Unjatwa are, you would have picked them by a huge margin, I would have done that the first time around. But now that you know the true nature of these elf-ogre hybrids, you can't wait to hear more about them. Welcome to Mastara. Today we're talking about one of the most obscure, yet very Mastaran races, the Unjatwa. Take the body of a small ogre and the brains of a not-quite-super-genius elf, then throw in the ogre's love of sentient flesh and the elf's cold pragmatism, and you get one of the most memorable races that no one remembers, and and one of the least artistically represented creatures in TSR. God, there is only one picture of an Njatwa in all of TSR, so I'm having to wing it here. But it's time to meet the neighbors to the south. I'm Mr. Welch, and it's time to swap long pork recipes. The Unjatwa first appeared in Dragon Magazine 158, where they were introduced in the Princess Ark storyline. Okay, that's the only place they ever appeared. They never made it into any of the monster manuals, or even the Champions and Mastara box set, since that only covered Princess Ark issues 169 and onward. So if you haven't read 158, you've never heard about them. Fortunately, I have. The Unjatwa, aside from being very hard to spell, letting the Madri's work off the hook, also inspired Wizards of the Coast to adopt the apostrophe policy, where every new creature needs at least one apostrophe. And the more dangerous they are, the more apostrophes needed. Eventually they're going to have to switch from the challenge rating to the apostrophe system, so if you're facing the dreaded Blarg, it's a low-level challenge due to the lack of apostrophes, but the legendary Blarg Farg Darg Zarg is quite deadly due to the fact that it has three apostrophes. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. The Unjatwa were originally two tribes, the Nunjar Elves and the Hatwa Elves. Both lived in a small region surrounded by high mountains and frozen terrain that limited the amount of land that you could grow crops on. Because of the limited space for growing food or building homes, the two races clashed frequently. Finally, an ogre shaman named Utaba got a message from his immortal that the constant wars were going to doom both races, and the only way to stop it was for the two tribes to become one. Remember, Mastara races can't interbreed easily. It's impossible for humanoid and demi-human races to do so at all. So Utaba was given the Altar of the Stars, a powerful artifact that would allow the two races to merge into a single species. Upon revealing this to both tribes, they promptly killed him in a hail of arrows and boulders for speaking nonsense. Soon after Utaba's demise, his disease hit both tribes hard and they could no longer wage war because their numbers were dwindling. They realized that the disease would be the wrath of Utaba's immortal and the only way to stop it was to use the Altar and merge the races. Blood was mingled, oaths were sworn, and the disease stopped. Months later, the first Unjatwa was born. Soon both tribes were gone, and their ancestors shared the blood of both races. Then the new race abandoned their ancestral home that had grown too small to sustain their numbers, painted their faces green and yellow, and moved to Green Bay. I'm not making that part up about Green Bay. It's on page 15 of the magazine. I'm guessing TSR had more than a few Packers fans back in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Green Bay became the location of the new Unjatwa nation that they imaginatively named Unjatwa Land. Fortunately, unlike the tradition of naming the capital city after the nation, the clan chief Kitakanga of the Unjatwa holds court in Mbanyika. The exact number of Unjatwa is unknown, but in his journal, Haldemar estimates the population of the capital is about 35,000, with only 500 in the first village that he encounters. With the size of the nation and the number of cities on the few maps I could find, there's probably between 50 and 100,000 of them in the known world. They're not a numerous species, but they are a feared one. Physically, the Unjatwa are tall, about 7 to 8 feet tall, shorter than ogres and nowhere near as muscular. They have reddish skin and black hair that they usually put into tassels. They have keen hearing like their elven ancestors and dark vision as well. They probably have immunity to ghoul touch, but that's never mentioned. They like to dress in bright colorful clothes and prefer to keep their homes and villages spotless, another trait of their elven ancestors. The race is as intelligent as they are strong, and magic use is common among the Unjatwa, with more magic users than not. The race prefers druids to clerics, but clerics aren't unheard of. Their magic isn't as powerful as the other races. In the dragon articles, they could get up to level 4 arcane spells, but only first level druid spells. They consider themselves civilized. They construct cities and have a well-established system of government, as well as a developed legal system, as the original article suggests. They embrace slavery as both a form of punishment and a method to sustain their nation. They seem to have a large gnomish population, as well as multiple humanoids they use as slaves. They didn't have any human slaves except for a captured Helden knight that had been spying on them when uh, Prince Haldemar arrived. Their habit of capturing slaves doesn't win them any friends with their neighbors, but their large size and ability to use magic makes them a formidable enemy. The slaves are used as manual laborers, taking care of chores and the fields, as well as working as the uh, lumberjacks to bring in the wood that they make most of their buildings out of. And if the slaves have outlived their usefulness, they can serve as food. The more memorable part of the Unjatwa, obviously, is that they are cannibals. Or more precisely, they view other sentient species as food. They don't eat each other, but Noel and Orc are definitely on the menu. They consider their culinary tastes normal. They don't think twice about offering a friend or a visitor a meal from their larder. 
To them, the thought of eating another creature isn't evil. It's always been the way. Food for the Unjatwa was hard to find before their migration, so what qualifies for food to them is a pretty large range. They do have agriculture, and they raise animals. Haldemar talks about them offering him bread and notices them riding giant lizards on their visit to one of their villages. They eat other species because they like to. To them, other creatures are of lesser status, and that makes them food. They respect strength, so creatures that show their power, like the Alphatians did, are treated as friends and not considered food. Who is or isn't food is largely determined by individual Unjatwa, though the clan chief can clear a group as not food like he did with the Princess Ark, and by extension the Empire of Alphatia. Bear in mind this protection ends immediately if you break one of their laws, in which case slavery is assured and ending up as dinner is a strong possibility. The race prefers to move around on giant pelicans that they have long tamed. Since their nation is heavily forested and mountainous, air travel is the best way to get around. The Unjatwa use the birds to fish, as they can scoop up large amounts of fish in each pass. They also hunt, as the Princess Ark was briefly confronted by Unjatwa hunters in Haldemar's account. They don't trade with outsiders often, they aren't well liked by their neighbors, and their primary trading partner was turned into Nagpa centuries ago, so instead the nation is largely self-sufficient. They grow their own crops, make what goods they require with the help of magic or slaves, and buy or take what slaves they need. They openly embrace for what other nations would be a terrible secret, making them intriguing to visitors as they are quite polite, but they're not willing to give up their slavery or their cannibalism. Using Injatwa in your campaign can come in a variety of ways. First, you can follow in the steps of the Princess Ark and discover the nation on your own. This lets your players discover that their new friends have some pretty nasty habits. Reversing that, having a new delegation from the Unjatwa land arrive in a port like Irindi or Minrathad, or even on the mainland, is a possibility. This would cause all sorts of excitement with the newly discovered race, until their cultural differences quickly come to light. Of course, if a player wants to run one, that would require some game design for 5th edition. The rules for Back Me were included in Dragon 158, and reprinted in a slightly cleaned up version over on 1D4chan. Or just wait a few weeks and they'll be magically transported to the Forest of Tethyr in the Forgotten Realms where they always have been and were never published anywhere else. This was the last topic of the first page of topics I originally wrote down for future videos. So it's on to page two, which adds the Trolladarn epic The Song of Halav to the list. Vote as you see fit. There's plenty of Mastara for everyone. Like and subscribe as always. And if you're feeling generous, check out my PayPal. I'm not one to torture you by adding commercials, because if you like to see one or more of those, you're not a dish, you're a man videos, I might decide to agree with the Unjot on how to deal with people you don't like. But I'm also trying to pay bills that were caused due to a car accident because someone decided to change into my lane and that cost me a week's pay. But until next week, remember, they can kill you, but they can't eat you.